It's a pleasure to introduce our opening keynote. The topic is super important. Social inflation has been, shall we say, a, a large, large uh, cloud over the insurance and captive insurance industries, particularly before the pandemic. It quieted it down during the pandemic. What people are thinking now is that it's going to come roaring back. Um, since we are now, with the vaccine, able to go to court and give our depositions and whatnot. So looking forward to, to this session particularly. It's my pleasure to introduce Jerry Theodro. Uh, he is the Director of Finance and Insurance and Trade Policy at, excuse me, at Trade Policy Program at R Street. Um, Jerry develops and advances effective free market public policy solutions to complex issue where federal and state governments have intervened. Welcome, Jerry. Take it away. Thank you, Keith, for that warm introduction. And thank you, uh, Keith and Gavin and Steve, Martha, for the opportunity to share with you some research that we've been doing at R Street which affects all of us, all of you. And uh, it seems that you can't go to an insurance conference these days and not hear a talk about social insurance. It's all over the place. But I think it's especially important and relevant for this audience, for the captive community. And why do I say that? Social inflation is about rising liability awards, rising liability claims. And when was the last time that we had a period when we had a lot of liability losses, loss ratios, combined ratios going through the roof. You think back, or if you read about, the great liability crisis of the 1980s. In the 1980s, capacity for liability insurance virtually dried up. Municipalities couldn't get insurance. Scout camps, outdoor activities, OBGYNs could get $250,000 of coverage for $250,000 of premium so they were hanging up their shingle or moving to other states. So in the great liability crisis of 1986 is when it peaked. Time magazine famously had on its cover in bold letters, America, your insurance is canceled. But how did the industry respond? Bob Clements of Marsh and other smart folks in the insurance industry went down to Bermuda and they launched XL and ACE to provide capacity that was drained, excess casualty capacity with XL, 50x50, ACE on top of that, excess of $100 million. But what's important to remember and to know for this audience that many people don't remember is that ACE and XL were formed as group captives. That's right, group captives for their members. And in 1986 also, we had the passage of legislation, the risk the Retention Act of 1986, which laid the groundwork for translation, regulation, legislation in the different states for the formation of captives and risk retention groups. So in 1986, with the Risk Retention Act, the captive industry got its big boost. So that's why I say that liability claims rising is especially pertinent for the captive insurance industry. And something else happened in the great liability crisis. In the late 1980s, as the crisis began to wane and insurers were getting the right reserving, the right underwriting and the rates, profits returned, premiums tripled in the latter half of the 1980s, and insurers were back in the black combined ratios, loss ratios coming down, and insurers were making money. They had so much money, actually, that some of them loosened their hiring standards and they let in some people that could fog a mirror, and that's how I got my start in the insurance industry in the late 1980s, so I'm grateful for that. But seriously, there are some things that we need to pay attention to, some signals. We're seeing adverse prior year development. We're seeing DNO and cyber liability insurance rates increase in the triple digits. We've got commercial auto that's been the bad boy of the property casualty insurance industry for the last 10 years, getting double-digit rate increases, but not still keeping up with loss costs. So it seems as if there's something going on. So let's explore this. And the way we're going to explore that is by 
looking at four questions about social inflation. First, what is it? Second, is it real? Third, if it's real, then what are its drivers? What causes it? And fourth, what can be done about it? How can we combat this trend if it exists? Let's start with a definition. What is social inflation? Well, simply put, it's growth in loss costs from non-economic factors. So non-economic inflation. Economic inflation, we're very familiar with. We're reminded of the uh, CPI going up 6 7% year on year. Inflation coming back. Is it transitory or is it going to be baked in? We don't know. And other aspects of uh, economic inflation, bottlenecks in the supply chain, shortages of labor, driving up labor costs, microchips not there for the automobiles, driving up costs of automobiles, building materials going up. So we've got, that's economic, but non-economic drivers of social inflation are those attitudes, societal attitudes regarding responsibility, duty of care, the value of pain and suffering, the value of a life. So those are the drivers of, of social inflation. And that's what it is. And is it real is the next question. Well, this is an important question because there is a school of thought. There are many people out there that what I call are social inflation deniers. They maintain that social inflation isn't real. It's fake. It's a hoax. It's a fix hoax, a fiction, not real. And this argument is advanced more, most forcefully by what we might call consumer advocacy organizations or consumer watchdog groups. A little over a year ago, there was a report that was jointly issued by two of these groups, the American Association of Justice and the um, uh, Consumer Federation of America produced a report which had a provocative title. The title is Cash Rich cash-rich insurance industry fakes crises and invents social inflation. You get a sense from that long title where they're going to come down. But let me give you a quote from the interior of the report. And I quote, In the current run-up to a new hard market, the insurance industry needed a new public relations term to make the case for higher rates. It has settled on a new name to describe its current interest in raising prices social inflation, but it is a hoax, a way for insurers to dot, 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 justify unnecessary rate hikes. Now, I'd like to give a little bit of context to those kinds of statements, to that kind of report, to those organizations. The uh, Consumer Federation of America, by the way, some news you may not have heard, Bob Hunter, who was the former insurance commissioner of Texas, was heading Consumer Federation of America, announces retirement. And the other one, the American Association of Justice, is the rebranding of the old ATLA, the American Trial Lawyers Association. But now it's called the American Association for Justice. But to give a little context, in the 1980s, when we had the great liability crisis, they denied that it existed, that it was a creation, it was a fiction, it was a hoax that was created by a greedy, collusive insurance industry to scalp ordinary consumers. Well, we know that's not true because it was a crisis. We had 60 insurer insolvencies between 1983 and 1985. That's a lot. Some of the big names in the industry went down insolvent because of those under-reserved liability exposures. And then fast forward to about 1999, 2000, when medical malpractice insurance was having its own crisis. Again, they say that, oh, there was nothing going on. There's no, but, but there was. St. Paul, St. Paul, which at the time was the largest medical malpractice insurer, pulled out of the business because they were losing money hand over fist. In the last year of their writing medical malpractice, St. Paul took in $500 million of premium and paid out a billion dollars in losses. It's not a good sustainable business model, is it? And the CEO at the time, Jay Fishman, commented on an earnings call that continuing in this business in this way would lead to, would threaten the solvency of the company. This is the great St. Paul, 
prior to its merger with the Travelers. St. Paul back then had 10,000 um, employees. So that's the, the um, denial school. And there's another school of thought about social inflation that says that, yeah, maybe something's happening, but it's not qualitatively different. It's just the cycle. We've seen this movie before. Yeah, we've got hard markets and soft markets, and we've got now in a hard market, and there's also the related tort cycle, where you have periods of tort reform, as we had in the 1990s with the two Bush administrations, when there were caps put on non-economic damages, and it was a more pro-business environment, which is followed by rolling back of tort reforms, a more populist, plaintiff-friendly environment, <clears throat> and arguably we're in that kind of environment today. And we had, uh, uncharacteristically, the prior administration, Republican administration, which was populist, which was anti-business. Kind of a conundrum, but we had that, and it's continuing now, a pro-plaintiff environment, plaintiff attorneys going into legislative roles in, in many states, the president of the uh, New Jersey Senate, a trial lawyer. So we're in that phase. And to fact check the comment in that report, which I cited from the uh, Consumer Federation of America, that says that the insurance industry just invented the term social inflation. In 1977, it was Warren Buffett who first used the term social inflation. 1977, in his letter to shareholders, Warren Buffett wrote that social inflation is a broad definition by society and juries of what's covered by insurance policies. Sound familiar? Well, he was right on the money, and that's why they call him the, uh, the sage of Omaha. And there's a third sort of intermediate school, the, the agnostics, that aren't sure about whether there's something happening or not. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was talking to a reinsurance broker that was doing research into social inflation, and they're finding that, that economic inflation actually is greater than social inflation. But it's not conclusive. It's hard to get the data, which is why I try to focus on things that can be measured so we can have facts rather than anecdotes and emotions and anger involved here. Um, so the, um, because the numbers are difficult to, uh, to suss out the truth from them. Brian Dupereau once famously said, in the context of talking about insurance company financial reporting and statistics, that the insurance numbers don't reveal their secrets easily. And he's absolutely right, because the reserving process is slow to recognize emerging and developing trends in liability. There's a bit of a lag. It takes a couple of years. We've got the clouding from accident year and calendar year results. So the numbers are not 100% clear. And where do I come down on this debate? Well, I'm a believer. I believe that social inflation is real and that it is qualitatively different because there are some things that are happening today that weren't happening back then. And one event which pushed me over the edge was about a year ago, my nephew, who's a successful insurtech entrepreneur, real smart guy, he's got none of my genes, uh, wrote to me and said, Uncle Jerry, have you heard about this robot lawyer that allows you to sue people very easily? I said, no. I invite you to look it up. Take a note, do not pay.com. No spaces, do not pay.com. And it bills itself as the first robot lawyer. Sue anyone at the touch of a button. So you go to do not pay.com sue anyone at a touch of a button, and then you choose medical malpractice, professional liability, trip and fall, dereliction of duty, and you, I think there's 80 different kinds of lawsuits that you can file, and it makes it real easy. Now, if you told me you know, 20, 30 years ago when I was in the casualty business that you can just pick up the phone and start suing people automatically, or maybe a, a shoe phone, if anyone remembers what that is, I would have thought it was a joke, some skit on Saturday Night Live, but it's real. So we are living in different times, I argue. So if you're with me, and if you're not, then just follow along in believing that it's real, what drives it? Where does it come from? Well, I maintain that the, the strongest driver of social inflation is structural and behavioral change at the plaintiff bar. What do we mean by structural change? Well, the plaintiff bar is, is much more collegial than it used to be. They share information, 
they've got conferences and the uh, techniques and the stories are told and they work as co-counsel, smaller solar practitioner firms will feed business into the large powerhouses, Koskoff and Koskoff up in Connecticut, uh, and the uh, larger firms that have got intellectual and financial capital, which they didn't have before. And whereas before it was a very closed community, now they're opening up. And there's two websites that have webinars from about 200 of the most successful plaintiff attorneys talking about their stories, their techniques, talented people, and they're sharing this information with people like, like me, so it's available. So they're much more collegial, much more cooperative business model. And you've got migration. Migration from profit centers that are not as profitable as they used to be, like medical malpractice, which really was the focus of tort reform. Think of California with MICRA, still capped at 250,000 for pain and suffering. So talented plaintiff attorneys that were in fields like medical malpractice gravitating into areas that are richer, better profit center pools such as commercial auto, truck accident litigation. And there's specialization in the plaintiff bar where you have someone that focuses on the construction of trucks, someone that knows about the regulation and cooperating with each other to build a powerful case. So those are some of the structural changes. The behavioral changes I think are very powerful because there we have the effective use of of human psychology in the courtroom. I mean, it used to be that plaintiff attorneys were trying to elicit sympathy uh, for an injured plaintiff, but now the goal is to elicit anger in the jurors, anger, retributive justice, send a message, send a signal. Let me give you an example of a closing statement of a summation in a very big case from the plaintiff attorney. And I quote, this is what he said to the jury. A corporation isn't like an individual. It doesn't have a heart. It doesn't have a brain. You can't punish it the way that you punish children or the way that we punish adults. The only way to punish a corporation is in their pocketbook. Now there's two problems, and this is typical. This is what they're taught to do. And there's two problems with this kind of summation. First, it uses the word punish four times. And civil litigation, tort law, is not meant to punish, it's meant to compensate. To compensate for economic losses, and yes, there's a component for pain and suffering, that has to be reasonable, but the punitive aspect isn't there. And these are, those latter two areas is where the dollars get loaded in. And the other thing is that it violates rules of attorney behavior. The uh, federal rules for evidence, rule 403, proscribes stimulating a result that's based on emotions. But this is what they're doing. This is what's done, and it works. And you had in 2009 something that changed the world in many uh, legal circles, the publication of the book by Ball and Keenan on the reptile, the reptile manual for the plaintiff attorney. The reptile theory summarized is that we human beings have got a vestigial part of our brain somewhere in the back from the long process of development that is a vestige of the reptile. We were once like reptiles and we're afraid of dangerous situations and if someone creates an unsafe situation, it's our job to fight back and to bite them and to hit them. And this is exactly what this kind of summation does, that you, the jury, are responsible for checking this irresponsible behavior that's a threat to society. You can save society with your decision and make it a big number. And that leads to anchoring. Anchoring is something that gets a lot of discussion these days. Anchoring is putting a number in the minds of jurors and putting it in early, even pre-trial, in voir dire, jury selection. Are you comfortable asking for 10 million? Can you ask for $10 million? And they hear that over and over, and the number gets stuck in their minds, and then when they come to deliver a verdict, 10 million is okay. There was a really good study done by uh, defense attorney Ferb Shab Amity in New York that studied the impact of anchoring and found that the anchor is actually very close to what's actually uh, handed down. Now, of course, the judge will cut that large amount. The 10 million may go down to 3 million in what's known as remitter, but 
the number is elevated because the bar is being pushed ever higher. So the reptile was a big revolution, but now the technique, the human psychology technique that's used a lot is what's called psychodrama. Psychodrama. In the training academy for plaintiff attorneys that's got their summer courses, a three-week course, now they're doing psychodrama, which is a combination of psychology, applied psychology, and drama. So in these training sessions, you've got professional trained actors from the stage that use the thespian magic, their techniques, with their expressions, with their language, with their voice, to get the response that they want. And to adjust with the times, it's a special course on how to use your eyes, because you're covered with a mask. If you're covered with a mask, they can't see your face and your expressions. But if you use your eyes appropriately, you can get at the, uh, the jurors. Amazing. There was, there was a course that was just announced a few weeks ago. And the um, new course is called The Courage to Ask, the Psychodrama of Money and Freedom in the Courtroom. And this is about anchoring, about asking for money. Don't be afraid to ask for the money. In the course description for this course, which is about 250 words, the uh, word money appears 11 times. The word justice appears once. Words matter, I think. So those are some of the ch changes in the uh, structural and behavioral in the, in the plaintiff bar. Another driver is attorney advertising. Attorney advertising has exploded. Yesterday, as I was coming in to the hotel from the airport, I counted six billboards on the side of 95 and another highway as we drove towards the hotel. 1-800-441, pain, slips and falls. Truck accident, call Rubenstein Law. Another one, some texter crashed into me. And then my favorite one was Jamie Suarez advertising his services. And about 100 yards later on the highway was a billboard for the lottery, 42 million in one uh, pot and 140 in the other. So I think they're kind of related, the two of them. Where are you going to get your $100 million? Uh, another one is litigation funding, the emergence of, of firms that advance money to plaintiff attorneys to finance litigation, because litigation against a big corporation is a seven-figure affair. So you have litigation funding, which is also an asset class. So you have investors putting money into litigation. It's uncorrelated with capital market risk, but it can influence the course of litigation. So I think it violates attorney-client privilege. There's some problems there. There's a lot of debate around it. There's a really good report by Swiss Re. There was an article last week in Forbes. But I think it's clear that the growth of litigation financing, and there are numbers that quantify how much it's grown, is a driver of, the, um, uh, of social inflation. So we've talked a lot about the, uh, about the plaintiff bar and, and what's going on, on there. But there's also changes in the defense bar, which haven't happened the way they have in the plaintiff bar. The defense bar, by definition, is defensive, doesn't take risks, it's not compensated the way plaintiff attorneys are. And one of the things that I hear in discussions with insurers and with defense firms is that there's more attention paid by insurers on, on spend, on the LAE, loss adjustment expenses, rather than on indemnity, which is where the dollars are. Why? Because the spend, the legal expense, is a controllable, whereas the indemnity is thought not to be, is not to be controllable, beyond their control. So for example, in, in choosing a defense physician, a claims examiner will often go for the lowest priced one available rather than going for the witness that's got the right combination of experience and expertise and knowledge of the jurisdiction. And we've heard many times that plaintiff attorneys do a much better job of humanizing their client than defense attorneys do of humanizing the corporation that they're defending. Now, this was a little bit controversial. A lot of people wouldn't go on the record. A lot of defense attorneys didn't want to go on the record with this because it could jeopardize their relationship with their clients, the insurance companies. But I've heard this many times, and some people did go on the record. Uh, and uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. 
And here's an insurer, an insurer that said in a recent podcast, this is no secret. Defense lawyers are more academic, more rule following, and not willing to bend the rules. And a, a defense attorney maintains, this is in correspondence to me, that carriers are very concerned about how much they spend on legal. They're more concerned about that and not as concerned, evidently, on cost of indemnification. See, that's what I call penny wise and pound foolish. The Geneva Association wrote a report which uh, focused on social inflation, and they said that the, um, here I quote, a very cost control mindset of insurer claims departments, commercial sensitivity over sharing information, together with a dose of complacency, have meant that the plaintiff bar, the plaintiff bar has forged ahead in relation to the defense bar in recent years, leaving the defense bar scrambling to play catch up. This is like bringing a knife to a gunfight. And I mentioned the Geneva Association report on social inflation, and I'm gonna go back to that a little bit because there's other drivers of social inflation. They talk in the Geneva Association report, which is a global study of courtrooms being a vehicle for redistributing income. So in countries where you have a big disparity between the rich and the poor, court awards are meant to bring those lower on the spectrum higher up, the Gini coefficient. And I looked to see if there was a correlation with the United States. I looked at the United States and saw where you had the biggest differences between the rich and the poor, and also where those states rank on the uh, Institute for Legal Reform ranking of states' uh, legal climates, and I found that there is some consistency there. And there's also people talking about younger jurors being more populist. So these things, I couldn't really quantify that well, so I'm not talking about them so much. Uh, now, what can be done? Finally, what can be done to combat this, this trend? First, advocacy. Advocacy at the state level mainly to push back against anchoring, against litigation funding, against something else which is called um, the um, uh, phantom damages, phantom damages, the difference between medical costs that are billed versus what's actually paid. In many states, some of these are allowed. In most states, these techniques are allowed and they work against the interests of defense. So advocacy to make the public, to make legislators aware of these trends. So advocacy is important. And the behavior of the defense bar to insist that in courtrooms they play by the rules. For rule 11 of the Federal Rule of Evidence, that a court can sanction parties that present frivolous arguments or argue, arguments that have no evidentiary support. I mentioned before Rule 403, which also says that if awards are excessive and bear no relation to the actual damages, then a new trial can be ordered. So I recommend that defense attorneys object, object frequently, have uh, discussions in limine, which is with the judge preventing certain evidence to be presented, which can elicit that emotional reaction. So these are some of the things that I found are recommended. And for captives, adverse development covers, lost portfolio transfers, to the extent that there's issues or concerns about the adequacy of liability reserves and shifting reserves to liability where things are exposed. So I've said a lot of things here. So I invite you to look at the, the study, which is available for free online, rstreet.org. R Street is the name of the uh, think tank I work for. All of our materials are out there on the website. You can see me afterwards. I'll be here for the duration of the conference. Love to exchange business cards. Tell you where you can find this information, the report, with data, with arguments, and would love to hear your comments in the future. And now we've got some time for questions, I think. Yes, Brian? OK. So microphone is here. Happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. And as you're thinking of a question, I'd just like to uh, congratulate you for coming out. Over 400 people here. 
shows that our business is a relationship business. The insurance business is about relationships, about long-term relationships, unlike other financial sectors, which are transactional, do a deal, walk away. In insurance, relationships are built on communication and trust. So coming here in person, talking to each other face-to-face, -face, deepening those relationships and, and, and the trust, I think it's a great thing, so it's great to be with you. Yes. Yeah, thanks. The question is about more information on the, on the development and the growth of litigation financing. Litigation financing was started really in Australia, in Australia, but now they prohibit it because it's so bad. Uh, so it came to the United States where it's flourishing. In the last year, to answer your question directly, there were 41 litigation financing firms. Now there's 46. In one year, an 18% growth in assets under management. You've got two firms that are publicly traded, Burford and another one. There's an association of litigation finance companies that was formed two years ago. So it's a, it's a growing industry, and it is pretty controversial because if you have shareholders of a public company or third parties that want this case to go to trial but the plaintiff is willing to settle and doesn't want to roll the dice, then who's going to win? Now, the litigation finance firms will say that, well, we don't, we don't influence litigation, but their model is based on the expectations of shareholders or the owners. The same reason why physician practices have to be owned by physicians. Because if they're owned by a private equity firm or a business, you're going to have some doctor doing you know, 10 operations a day to maximize the, the income. No, it's got to be run by someone who's profound. And law firms also. Law firms are not publicly traded for the same reason. It's about justice. Thank you for the question. We have a couple minutes remaining. Thanks. So, yeah, the question is, for those that didn't hear, what's the relationship between social inflation and, and uh, economic inflation? Well, there's no clear answer to that. It varies by line of business. The, uh, there was a report that just came out two days ago, actually, which, which looked at that, uh, a report that was jointly issued by the Casualty Actuarial Society and the III, the Insurance Information Institute, which is out there for free, that looked at commercial auto liability, because that's the place where it's hitting the hardest. And they found that there was $20 billion of additional loss cost in the last 10 years due to social inflation. And a modeler that I saw tried to quantify the, the Gini coefficient and uh, nuclear verdicts, the amount of remitter. So there's no clear answer, but if, if, I were, if I were to guess, I would say overall, if you got commercial auto and DNO and products liability and uh, CGL, commercial general liability, between 20 and 30% is social inflation. I mean, a lot of firms have had adverse development and some commercial auto specialists, look what happened to Atlas, you had Spirit Risk Retention Group, they threw in the towel because they uh, were hit by some of these cases and, and they talked about them. The, the politic envi political environment and the social environment, yes, I believe that, that it does. I believe that it does. The, uh, populist-driven approach is that corporations are bad, they're greedy, they care only about 
profits, they don't care about safety, they don't care about people. So you have, when you have that kind of uh, attitude, then that drives it up. And if you have the opposite, if you've got more pro-business, you know, think Delaware, you have less sympathy for frivolous arguments which you know, should be thrown out. But absolutely, it does. And the reason I don't talk about it so much is because it's hard to quantify. You know, it's hard to quantify. How do you put a number to it? And like the youth factor, that young people in juries are more populous, they've got more tender hearts, and they're more prone to, to give, uh, give out larger awards. I mean, there was some research done at law schools with mock trials, finding baby boomers on the one hand in a mock trial versus uh, Gen X, and found that the Gen X people you know, had two times the number that the baby boomers like me would come up with. So yeah, those factors do, do play out, and it varies from state to state. There's a lot of uh, variation you know, between Delaware on the one hand and Missouri on the other. Yes, the, the uh, Geneva the Geneva Association report has a global look at this, but the U.S. is more litigious than most other countries. But the next ones are the U.K. and um, and Australia, where uh, after all litigation funding was, was founded in Australia, but it is in other countries as well, and that's why I'm glad that some organization, reputable objective organization, did take a global look at this. Uh, yeah, U.S., the most litigious, and in other places, you have this growth happening as well. That's a question, yeah. Are we looking at the, what the next the next area for the, the plaintiff bar? Not not uh, personally, not at my firm. There's other firms like uh, Predicat out, out in California that mines the scientific literature and looks for what is what might be the next asbestos. So they come out with estimates or forecasts at fen fen or other kinds of chemicals. Typically, something that's taken in the body that has got mass distribution that affects not just the community, but lots of people. Um, and it's, it's worth following their, their, their research. Great, I think we've uh, to have time for one last question, and then we'll break. Oh, someone's scratching. And hearing none, thank you very much.